Okay, hello. Thank you for joining us for this Cal Week information session for Rouser College undeclared major students. Uh, my name is Joshua Delahan, and my pronouns are he, him, his. Uh, and I'm the Assistant Dean of Instruction and Student Affairs for Rouser College. Um, I'm going to be serving as the moderator for the session and uh, also assisting me in moderation uh, uh, is our amazing intake advisor, Craig Crosley. Craig, you want to come in and say hello? Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Craig Crossley, uh, he, him, his. Uh, I have been the intake advisor for Rouser College um, Office of Instruction and Student Affairs for about two years now. Um, and I am kind of the go-to person to help uh, answer college questions, deadlines, timelines. Um, I run our social media account at CNR Advising on Instagram and we have a Facebook. Um, I do the newsletters and um, uh, various other kind of college-wide emails, reminders about deadlines and policies, things like that. Um, but I'd also uh, be happy to answer your questions and um, connect you with major advisors or help you kind of get in touch with the peer advisors or other programs around campus. So welcome and a uh, pleasure to meet you. Cheers. Great. Thank you, Craig. Uh, to start off with, um, I'd like to recognize that uh, UC Berkeley sits on the territory of the Huchin, the ancestral and unceded land of the Chicano speaking Al Alone people, uh, the successors of the sovereign Verona band of Alameda County. Uh, this land was and continues to be of great importance to the Muekmua Ohlone tribe and other familial descendants of the Verona band. Uh, we recognize that every member of the Berkeley community has and continues to benefit from the use and occupation of this land since the institution's founding in 1868. And consistent with our values of community, inclusion, and diversity, we have a responsibility to acknowledge and make visible the university's relationship to Native peoples. Uh, as members of the Berkeley community, it is vitally important that we not only recognize the history of the land on which we stand, but also we recognize that the Muekma Ohlone people are alive and flourishing members of the Berkeley and broader Bay Area community today. You can learn more if you go to aloneland.berkeley.edu. Okay, so next I would like to outline today's information session before introducing our panelists. Uh, if you may have noticed, you can see us, but we can't see you uh, or hear you. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Uh, Craig will make sure uh, that we see them and we will get to those questions towards the latter part of our presentation. Uh, we'll be starting with three initial questions for our panelists. Uh, after those three questions, we'll begin answering your questions. Uh, so feel free to start uh, asking questions as you think of them, um, and we'll put them in the queue. Um, we're also recording this session and the chat log uh, and hope to post it to our Cal Week website later on this week. Um, lastly, at the end of our session, we'll post some contact information for us if you have additional questions or if we miss your question. Sometimes everyone's questions come at the very end of <laughs> our information sessions and we're not able to get to everyone. So um, yeah, uh, we'll post some contact information for that. Um, now that we have all those logistics out of the way, let me once again welcome you to Cal Week uh, and the information session for Rouser College Undeclared Majors. Um, for those of you who are new admits, which I assume most of you are, congratulations on your admissions to university. Uh, we know you've worked very hard to make it uh, into Cal and we are excited to meet you. Um, we hope that you find this information session helpful uh, and that it will help you decide to join Cal in the fall. So today we have a couple of panelists with us um, to talk about what's it like being a Rouser undeclared major. Uh, first, we have Anna, uh, excuse me, Anna, I added an H there, Anna Hohenrieder, uh, uh, the academic advisor for undeclared major students. Anna. Hello, everyone. Thank you again for coming to this session. Again, like Jeff said, my name's Anna. I use she, her pronouns. Um, I'm the undeclared major advisor as well as the major advisor for the molecular environmental biology students here in the college. I also advise for two minors, which would be the energy and resources group and sustainability minor. And some of the other projects I have in the college would be commencement as well as orientation. So if you're coming here, then I'll help see you for planning our college orientation days with you. And I've been in the college for about three and a half years. 
Great, thank you, Anna. Uh, next, we have Rachel. Rachel, would you like to tell us a little bit about yourself and how you're associated with OISA? Hi, everyone. My name is Rachel. I use she, her pronouns. I'm a current fourth year student in microbial biology, and I'm also a peer advisor for Rouser College, so um, perfectly equipped to answer most, if not all, of your questions uh, today. So I'm really excited to be here, and yeah, thanks for attending. Great. Thank you. Okay, so the initial questions that we are going to start off with um, are the following. Um, so I'm going to list all three of them just so you know what's coming. Um, and then we'll go back uh, to the top and start from the beginning. So Anna, the first question I'm going to ask you is if you can give us an overview of the major options available at Rouser College. Um, and what does it mean to be an undeclared major within this college? Um, Rachel, when we, uh, after we get that answer, we're going to turn to you and ask for you, uh, what was it like starting off as an undeclared student? And what, uh, how'd you go about choosing a major for yourself? Um, after that, you know, we're going to go into some general advice about uh, what students should be thinking about when choosing a major. So to start off with, let's go back to Anna. Yes. And then I'm I'm posting in the chat right now a link. So that's a link to our majors in the college. We have nine of them. Generally, we split them along bioscience focused and social science lines. So the main bioscience majors we have would be genetics and plant biology and microbial biology, both from the PMB or plant and microbial biology department. Then we also have the molecular environmental biology from the ESPM department or environmental science policy and management, as well as nutritional science and toxicology, which has three plans within it, a dietetic specialization, physiology and metabolism, as well as toxicology. Then in our ecosystems management and interdisciplinary studies, those are majors that have a bit of social science and a bit of bioscience to them. So there's the conservation and resource studies major, the ecosystems management and forestry, and the environmental sciences. And lastly, more our strictly social science majors are environmental economics and policy and society and environment. But generally, all of our majors have some connection to the natural world or to the environment, and they're, and they're quite flexible as well. Many students don't realize just how flexible some of the majors can be of the different options you might have within those. And we also get quite a few students who are both pre and kind of pre-health. So pre-med, pre-vet, pre-dental, those are all really common trajectories as well with the majors in our college, as well as lots of other graduate programs. We've seen people go off for programs for education and teaching to masters and PhD research. And then also to business type programs, working in finance. So it's a very wide mix of different majors as well as different outcomes that you can have within the college. Great, thank you, Anna. Uh, Rachel, uh, can you tell us a little bit what it was like starting off as an undeclared student and how'd you go about choosing a major? Yeah, so I see that someone already asked um, a question in the Q&A that's relevant to what I'm going to talk about, but I actually came into Cal as an LNS student. Um, all LNS students come undeclared, so experience is pretty similar in that sense. Um, so what I did was I was actually intended um, MCB, and then I ended up switching to IB, and then I decided that microbiology was actually um, the best fit for me. So what I did was I went to talk to uh, the MB advisor, who's Patricia, and uh, she told me about how if you wanted to switch from LNS to CNR, you have to complete a certain number of lower division requirements. Um, and if you are coming into LNS as intended MCB or IB, those requirements are actually like exactly the same. So there's nothing you have to worry about there. All you have to do is complete those requirements and then complete a uh, Two year, yeah, two year plan because most likely you'll be at the end of the year, second year when switching, and then have Patricia, uh, Patricia sign off on that, and then you'll be switched into CNR. And then as for why I chose uh, microbiology, 
I felt that it was kind of like a good in between, uh, kind of between NCB and IB in terms of like scale of biology. So I like looking at small stuff, but I also like looking at the ecology of the small stuff. So it's kind of integrating like those kind of like micro scale things with macro scale um, population concepts. So I thought that microbiology had a really good variety of upper division electives that um, LNS didn't really provide for me. Um, so yeah, that's how I ended up choosing MD. Thank you, Rachel. We have another pal joining us, Olivia. Olivia, I was wondering if you might introduce yourself. Uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, maybe what your current major is, and then dive right into the same question that Rachel uh, answered, which is how did you go about picking the major that you uh, chose and what was it like starting off as an undeclared student? Right, so hi everyone, my name is Olivia. I use she, her pronouns and I am a conservation and resource studies second year declared within Rouser College. And I'm happy to be here to um, help out and answer your questions. So um, the reason why I chose CRS after originally being undeclared was because I actually spent my first summer being, um, I spent my first summer before freshman year on campus with Summer Bridge, the Summer Bridge program. And um, I just got to spend a lot of time on the kind of CNR side of campus with Mulford Hall and all those, you know, that, that side of campus, which um, uh, I just, I spent a lot of time there and I was taking ESPM 50AC at the time over the summer. And um, I just really liked the community over there. And I really liked the people within the college. And I realized slowly as um, my freshman year went on that I actually didn't want to stay with my original major. So I decided, well, I need to choose something that would be kind of um, more flexible because I'm still like kind of undecided, but I know that I wanna be part of this amazing community on campus. So that's when I found out about CRS and how like interdisciplinary and flexible and just kind of how like cool and that major is, especially at Berkeley. Like I haven't, you know, there really isn't a major like this anywhere else. And so, um, uh, yeah, I decided to give it the green light and I started meeting with Sarah Hamilton, who's the CRS advisor. And we started doing all the, all the paperwork and I just wanted to, <laughs> I wanted to be part of browser college as soon as possible. So I was basically like declared by my the end of my freshman year because I took all the necessary like lower division classes and yeah I was just um I was and then um yeah I just felt so lucky to be part of this amazing community and it, was there another question or did I pretty much cover it I think you covered it yeah it was great thank you um, well, actually, you know, Olivia, while we're still talking with you, why don't you be the first one to maybe offer some, what would be some advice that you would give an undeclared student as they're figuring out how they're picking, how to pick a major? Yeah, um, some advice that I would give to someone who is deciding what major they want to go into is kind of decide long-term where you could see yourself. And if that answer is kind of like, is more open-ended and um, kind of like undecided and you're still unsure where you would end up in a career, I would say um, the best majors in RCNR for that kind of like undecided are of course <laughs> undecided. And then there's CRS, which is our interdisciplinary major and society environment, which is very similar to CRS in that you get to choose a lot of your classes and kind of like create your major. And then from there, I would just say, Come, come talk to the pals, like come to our virtual office hours if you can, you know, um, go on our front page and see which pals um, are, t are um, declared in which majors and then talk to them about their major, about their experiences on campus. It's always great to talk about like students that are already on campus because they have that experience of um, being on a big campus and all these resources and organizations and majors um, where, you know, you have to like kind of figure out and navigate um, who you are and what you want to go into. And if that's more flexible, then um, definitely, you know, talk to one of the pals or someone else that you know in an organization and kind of get their experience with um, Canvas resources. Great. Thank you, Olivia. Uh, Rachel, do you have some advice that you would offer undeclared students? 
Yeah, I think going off of Olivia's last point of just really branching out, um, trying not only just classes, but joining different clubs on campus, um, really take your first semester and first year to just take a low number of units. The minimum is 12 here in Rouser College, and then use the rest of your time to delve into research or clubs of which we have, you know, volunteer service clubs. We have uh, tech related clubs, environmentally related clubs. Um, we actually have a pretty robust uh, robust um, environmental advocacy community here. So be sure to check out um, CERC um, if one of y'all could link CERC's information below. Um, but yeah, just don't be afraid to branch out and kind of cut down on the coursework if you can for your first year. And uh, as the advisor for undeclared students, have you seen some, um have some other advice more broadly, depending upon if a student might be in the bio and sciences, you know, interest or social science interest, or maybe a blend of the two, what, what advice might you impart? I would say that within our college, there's a good amount of flexibility, but especially in your first couple of years, definitely exploring different options is good. Um, and also just as you're thinking about majors, I would suggest looking at the snapshots, which are available on the major page itself and looking at really what you'd be doing within each major. I think a lot of times people might think there's only certain majors that they can do for certain paths, like they think they have to do a particular major for pre-med and they have to do a particular major for pre-law. But really almost all graduate programs will take most majors from undergrad. So it's really about what you want to study here and what you would like to focus on with the majors. And after you've gotten some experience with what was looking over what you would be doing for the other courses, talking to people about what those courses are like, then I think that can really help you figure out exactly which major could be good for that. Great, thank you. Um, so we're going to turn over to some questions from our Q&A list. Um, the first one is relatively easy, so I'm just going to answer it in the chat. So someone asked how to get a hold of Craig or to ask general inquiries. Uh, you would write an email to askcnr at berkeley.edu, and that's now in the chat. Um, now, uh, you know, as students are hearing you, some are thinking, wow, I'm in Browser College and maybe this isn't the right college for me. Or they're in another college and they're thinking, oh my gosh, that's a really cool college. I wanna be in Browser College. Uh, Anna or, or the pals, can you talk a little bit about maybe the process of switching colleges, uh, either leaving Browser or coming into Browser? Yeah, um, I can talk a little bit about that. So. When I um, was in LNS, I felt kind of lost because I didn't know who my advisor was and I didn't know who to reach out to first about changing majors. So um, I basically took it upon myself to do a little research and that's always good to do, you know, start maybe um, a document or a notes tab or a spreadsheet kind of documenting different majors, their advisors and different classes that you can take in those majors. Definitely, you know, look at the classes because although a major could say one thing, it might require a very specific set of classes. So you wanna make sure that you would be willing to take um, and interested in taking those classes um, and spending that time, your, time, your time that way on campus. So um, definitely like fill out that information and then maybe make like a pros and cons list for um, how you, based on your, based on your research, how those majors would fit for you and how they would fit for your career goals and where you wanna go after college and where you see yourself in 10, five, 10 years. Um, yeah, and then also always make sure to reach out to advisors and use the resources available to you on campus because um, although you may have done your own research and kind of come up with your own answers, there, there are some times where there are discrepancies and you might have one understanding, but then things have changed and they haven't, updated it on a website. And so you need to like clarify. Um, yeah, that would, that would be my advice. Thank you. Uh, Rachel or Anna, do you have any other advice to impart? Yeah, um, so I touched on this briefly in the last question, but uh, just to quickly go over in general, what you would wanna do is uh, look at the requirements for a non-Rouser student 
uh, four classes you have to take to transfer to Rouser College. That's the link I just put in the chat. So what you wanna do is take all of these courses, um, but also talk to an advisor first, just to kind of sort out everything that you have to do. And then after you complete those courses, you'll be able to fill out your schedule plan for the rest of your time in college and then present that to the respective advisor and then they'll sign you off on uh, your approval to change into Rouser College. Thanks for mentioning that, Rachel. I completely blanked on that, so thanks. And there's kind of a, a spin-off question there uh, on my Q&A. Uh, asking about how do you specifically get into the Haas School of Business? Well, so my first job on the UC Berkeley campus was as the admin assistant for the Haas undergrad program. So I was basically, I was uh, the intake advisor. I was Craig's position uh, many, many, many years ago. Um, so Haas has a competitive admissions process um, and you can find out more information on their website, which I'll put in the chat here. Um, but basically it's similar to what we've talked about in terms of when you become a rising sort of sophomore going into your junior, you're gonna be applying to, to, uh, to move into uh, uh, the business major. And it is a competitive process. They aren't able to admit everyone into that major. Uh, but for more information, reach out to that office. They're super friendly. Uh, many of the advisors there are uh, the same advisors that are there when I work there. So they have tons of institutional knowledge on the Haas School of Business and how uh, that major works. So. Uh, there's that. Next, oh, I know that 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 this uh, this next one, our our pals, are are definitely involved in this research. What types of research and internship opportunities are possible with Rouser College? And I'm going to add one sort of one more question to sort of spin off of this: Is did you feel behind it all being an undeclared student starting off? You know, did you feel like, oh gosh, I can't do research, or I can't study abroad, or I can't do something because I started off undeclared. Yeah, um, I, that's a really good question, Josh. And I'm really excited to answer this because um, I think on a similar note, there might be a lot of us here who don't have research experience coming into college um, because you know, Cal's full of a bunch of impressive students and maybe they did research in high school and all of that and you might feel imposter syndrome. Please don't, um, I didn't come in with research experience and. I tell people this all the time, like the number one thing you should be doing is cold emailing professors. Um, so the programs, before I talk about cold emailing, the programs we do have in Rouser are uh, SPUR. And um, I, yeah, I think that's sponsored program for undergraduate research. So that is a Rouser specific database where you can apply to faculty initiated projects or student initiated projects if you have an idea and you can get involved in research that way. Uh, but in case you don't have luck with SPUR or you want to increase your ways of getting research experience, you can also directly email professors expressing your interest in the work. And the way you do that is by saying, hi, I'm this student with this kind of background and interests. Um, I read this paper of yours or I saw this work on your website and I'd be really interested to get more involved in that by doing X. And um, hopefully they get back to you and um, would want to talk to you, interview you from there, and you can get involved that way as well. Um, but yeah, in general, like, please don't feel afraid if you don't have research experience. Um, you can definitely get involved without experience at Carl. I wish I had more to say on this question. Um, I myself have not been involved in research yet. I'm only a second year, but I hope to get involved in research on campus. Um, my junior year, but I would also say go through the same resources like SPUR. And then if none of those um, opportunities interest you as much as you wish they did, you can also check out UROP, which is um, the more broader campus um, research opportunities program. So you can, you can look at um, research that's happening in different departments on campus that maybe aren't part of yours, but that you're interested in. And then that's open to all students, of course, not just um, Rouser or one college or the other. Um, and yeah, was there something about other than research that was part of that question, Josh, that I missed? I would say internship opportunities or really any sort of academic opportunities. I know sometimes coming in as undeclared, you can it can be a little scary being like, oh my gosh, I haven't picked my major and all of these other people already know what their majors are. You know, from my perspective as an undergrad, I came in as a declared major 
And I switched it four times before I went back to my original major, but I needed to go on that exploration to realize how much I really loved my original major that I had picked. So um, I don't know, any thoughts about so sort of those fears of coming in undeclared? So I wish I had learned this sooner, but um, making connections is really like the number one thing in college, I think. So um, joining different organizations and talking to people in positions that you're interested in taking up as well. Like, let's say you are interested in um, being part of the Student Environmental Resource Center, CERC on campus. Um, you can you know, join or find someone on their team whether you find it through, um, I'm trying to think, you could definitely find it on their website, the people that are involved in CERC, but you kind of like make those connections and then you talk to them about um, what they wish they had, know, they had known before they, come, before they came to campus. Sorry, I'm jumbling my words. Um, and you just learn from people that are older than you and that, are, that have had experience in internships and different fields that you're also interested in because they can really like give you that advice that you need in that kind of direction that you might need instead of um, just kind of applying to a bunch of random internships and opportunities on campus or off campus and then kind of ending up in a position that maybe you didn't want to be in. Um, also there's um, those kind of resources are like Handshake or LinkedIn. Definitely make sure that you have a LinkedIn account you don't really if you don't have any experience that's fine you don't really need to list anything just make sure you create one and you start one and then you start making those um, virtual connections and then handshake is more through Berkeley itself and um, that's just a great way to see internship postings job postings um, summer opportunities you know school opportunities all these different things that you can like see and you can favorite and then you can look at the application deadlines and all that kind of stuff and organize it that way. And one more thing to add, um, especially for the people interested in the biosciences for summer, we have, or not, sorry, not we, um, the country has uh, NSF REUs, which just means National Science Foundation uh, Research Experiences for Undergrads. And these are paid opportunities um, that you can take up for the summer. Um, and it's also fine if you don't have experience, but like Olivia said, the networking is important because they often do require recommendations. So as long as you have people who can recommend you, then um, that's a great way to get involved in research um, off campus. Um, and I'll link that in the chat soon. And a lot of these programs that um, our pals are telling you about, um, we actually specifically highlight and present to you all um, in the weekly newsletter that I, we curate. So we have um, a virtual bulletin board we've been using this year. I reckon we'll probably carry it on because it's it's actually been a tremendous resource. Um, but we, we kind of curate and we get emails from all over, literally all of the country, all over the world um, with different internship opportunities, job openings, summer programs, um, even like on-campus happenings, student organization meetups, every, everything under the sun at Berkeley. Um, and uh, I'll write, so just sent one about 45 minutes ago, but every Monday I will email everyone in the college to say, hey, here's the new things we've added, here are you know, upcoming deadlines, um, here is an, you know, here's a great internship opportunity that we just added, um, go check it out. And then you can sort through that um, in addition to, and a lot of the things will link to Handshake like we've mentioned, but um, you could even sort, you say, hey, you know, I'm interested in forestry or I'm interested in something in biosciences and you can see which specific opportunities um, apply to you and you can seek those out. So um, yeah, sometimes you have to go, go get it and sometimes we bring opportunities to you. So um, it's just a fun, a fun little piece that, um, yeah, I think that it, it helps us kind of craft that community um, as well as, as, as have an open line of communication from our opportunities to you all. So yeah. I would also like to add something that um, if any undeclared students are interested in pre-law as I am currently actually, um, there's, there is um, PAD on campus, which is the pre-law fraternity, which is a co-ed fraternity. And they have kind of, you can join all throughout the year. It doesn't matter which semester. And you can definitely like do networking through that if you're interested in pre-law. Um, of course, you don't have to join if you're interested in pre-law. That's just like something that you can do on campus. And um, also, if you are pre-law, I will say that internships and research doesn't matter as much. Although 
research and volunteering would matter more over internships, which is, I know that's weird to like say, and it's, it's, it's like kind of, it's kind of um, against the grain here, but if you are pre-law, they really, um, they're going to look mostly at your grades. So how well did you do? How's your GPA? Did you like make connections? And did you um, keep, did you, if you didn't do so well your freshman year, did you, you know, progress and get better as your college career went on? And then, um, then they definitely would look at to um, your LSAT score. So those two things, if you're interested in pre-law are most important and internships and research and stuff like that is less important. Although you are, you know, of course, more than welcome to get involved and figure different things out if you're not exactly, exactly sure that you want to be pre-law and go to law school. This is all wonderful, great information. Um, before I go on to my next question, I just want to touch one, upon one thing that Rachel had said about reaching out to faculty members. I know it can be a little bit daunting or a little bit scary to, to cold email or to walk up to uh, a professor or go to office hours. Um, and I really want to persuade you to just take the dive and, and reach out to them. Um, one of my favorite uh, uh, book series is the Harry Potter series. And I like to quote one of the movies of saying, you know, every great wizard started right where we off here as, were as students. And every great faculty member started off as an undergraduate who had no research experience at some point. And it just, it's reaching out that first time and getting, uh, getting connected that starts people on those journeys. So, um, and I think our professors are, are aware of that and are really want to work with you to, to start building those connections. So I would encourage you to, uh, to take the dive in and to reach out to them. And we're gonna have opportunities too for them to, to get in touch with you. So we do a spur panel uh, every semester with faculty members who um, take students on regularly into their research um, opportunities um, and, and just talk about what they're looking for and how to make yourself the best candidate possible. Um, so that's my little plug. And I'm gonna switch over to courses. Um, Anna, would you be able to talk a little bit about maybe what a first year student might want to take if they're undeclared? Um, and would you suggest taking a lot of different units? Do you suggest sticking with 12 for the first semester? Um, yeah, any advice about the first semester course selection? We do generally see that students take about 12 or 13 units in the first semester. As far as what that is, it depends on the major you're interested in. Um, one that thing that's pretty common to, I think every major on campus is that everyone needs a reading composition course. There's two reading composition requirements. So if you didn't already have a test that resolved that, that's a very common first semester requirement. Also, there's some other courses that are pretty common. So in the biological sciences, we often see students doing a chemistry preparatory course or Chem 1A, which is the first chemistry course that's fairly common. A math class, all of our majors require at least one semester of math of some kind. So it, whether that's stats or it's math, that's pretty common for the first semester as well. And then also some breaths. All of our majors have some type of breath or other electives. So you'll, oftentimes you'll fill those in with those courses as well. Uh, and specifically with the environmental science policy and management, which is a department in our college that has five majors in it. All five of those majors require specifically a couple of courses from that department, which we call our SM cores. So if you're planning on one of those majors, that's a really common course for the first semester. And some of the other, the students can probably speak to some of these other courses, but there's a lot of things like seminars, decals, other courses that you can fit in to help fill out your schedule for the first year. Yeah, um, I wanted to add, if Anna didn't say this already, that um, every student at Cal also has to take an AC course. So that means American cultures. And you can find um, an AC course in all different departments on campus. So that's a great way to branch out um, if you want to try new things. Um, the course will literally just have like AC after the numbers. So for example, SBM 50 AC, that's how you know it's an American cultures course. Um, I would also say uh, do some cross-referencing. Like it, it might take a long time. I personally find it really fun, but if you don't, I swear it's worth your time. 
really look at like, okay, if I was a humanities major and I could take these intro courses, if I ended up hating it, does that then count for humanities breadth in a biosciences major? So doing some of that and seeing, just making sure that like in case you change majors, you're not necessarily missing a bunch of requirements after doing that. So I have a couple of questions that came in right at the beginning of our session and they've been waiting patiently in the audience to be answered. So uh, if I'm undeclared now, when should I, or when do I have to be declared by? So ideally we would like our undeclared student to be declared by the end of this second year. That should be doable for all of our majors. Um, if you're unable to do that, then we'll still work with you on figuring out majors, but we generally find that by the end of the second year, that is best, mainly because that gives you the full options of pretty much all of the majors at that point. Um, we do we do really work to have all of our students graduate in four years or almost about four years. So with that, we are actively working to make sure you're on track for those majors each semester. If you're unable to declare by the end of the sophomore year, then that sometimes can lessen your options for some of the majors. So if you are taking courses, making progress, then generally end of the second year would be best for declaring. And speaking of declaring majors, um, and I know uh, you have one foot in the undeclared student world and one in MEB or molecular environmental biology, and maybe you might be able to answer this next question of, uh, if your beginning is undeclared, but you know that you are your pre-vet, what would be the best major if I was pre-vet, veterinarian? So I think Rachel also put this in the chat too, but whether you're pre-med or pre-vet, you don't have to have any particular major in mind. Um, you just really have to do those requirements. Now there are definitely majors on campus that will match more with some of those requirements. So generally the requirements for medical school or vet school, it includes some calculus, chemistry, biology, physics. Within pretty much any of our bio-based majors, you'll be doing a lot of those courses anyways for the major. So most of those are the typical choices, but if you decide that you wanted to do something like society environment or environmental economics, then you really, they still give you a lot of flexibility. You can still fit in those requirements just know that it might not necessarily overlap with your major requirements as well. It might just be additional beyond what's for the major. Yeah, and to add on to that, um, I think a lot of pre-vet people specifically, MEB does become kind of a common major because there's an animal behavior um, emphasis. So if you are someone who wants to get a lot of like animal behavior material under your belt before vet school, um, MEB with that emphasis is a good choice. But again, you can do any major you want as long as you um, fulfill those prerequisites. Okay, this qu next question is a little bit, um, I'll say, uh, uh, Interesting, and I'm just going to read it out loud. I'm not sure if this change has, if this has changed, but I heard that lectures that are over a hundred people might be taught online in the fall because of COVID. If this is the case, would it be possible for an undeclared student uh, that they might end up with all large lectures for general ed and thus not have any in-person class, which would be a big bummer? Is there another way to build your schedule so that this doesn't happen? I actually um, have something small to say, and then Anna, you can go ahead. Um, but my personal recommendation would be to, first of all, if you haven't yet, click in person on Berkeley class schedule when you're searching for classes, which should be normally on the left-hand side, you can say, I only wanna look at in-person classes. And so that way you can automatically filter all the options to only the in-person classes. Um, other than that, I would recommend maybe reaching out to professors to gauge how they see their class panning out in the fall semester. You can ask, you know, politely cold, cold emailing as Rachel was talking about earlier, um, introducing yourself, introducing your, you know, your interested 
interest in a certain major or a certain you know department and then describe you know um, your your issue and what your question is. Also, um, language classes tend to be smaller classes. So if you're interested in taking a language, I highly recommend starting your first semester and you know taking that language intro class because they tend to be smaller in size. But don't take you know don't take my word for for um, for granted because there might be some classes that might not be as small as I'm talking about. But language classes tend to be smaller anyways. Um, also, there are um, there's fall program for freshmen, which if you choose to do um, a non, like if you choose to do a non on campus curriculum, um, fall for freshmen is kind of off campus and you take much smaller size classes. The downside to that is that you will not be on campus taking your classes, although you can enroll in decals, which are like one to two unit classes that um, will be on campus that you could take. And yeah. I just wanted to put a point of clarification. I think Olivia coming in for LNS, that was just an LNS option for fall program for freshmen. If you're coming into our college, it's not fall program for freshmen, but there are still courses like seminars and decals. Um, there are decals are student run courses. They're automatically small seminars or small courses. Those are all super common classes in your first year. And generally what we're seeing is the current plan is mostly in person. And even for large classes, almost every large class has also an in-person discussion component to it. So you can look on, on the class search and look and see if it has an in-person component. But I would say that it's common, yes, to take some large classes, but if you wanted to take small classes in your first semester, that's still definitely an option. You don't necessarily have to take large classes. The reading composition courses are small. There's a lot of small breath courses. So you're really not forced to necessarily take large classes. Although depending on certain majors, you might still need a math or a chemistry or a biology at some point. And those will of course be larger. I would also maybe add, thank you for clarifying on the LNS thing. Um, I, I totally forgot that FPF was only LNS, but um, if there is a class that you know you need to take your freshman year, because um, maybe you're planning out your schedule and you, and you say like, oh, well, I need to take this certain bio or chem or physics or something class before I can take this upper division or this other class to be prepared. Um, I would say just because they're, you know, larger and they're not in person, um, you know, still keep that in mind. Still keep in mind like the, your long-term plan. Even if you're sad that it's not in person and you won't get to be in, in a large lecture hall, think about, am I willing to kind of compromise this class for another semester just to, just to be in person? So, you know, consider different things when you're considering um, in person or remote. I also want to plug <clears throat> for uh, for freshmen. Um, there will be uh, hopefully a section of freshman seminar called "How to Be a Rouser CNR Scientist," which is a small class of twenty four uh, meant to um, just sort of if you've never done research before, if you're not really familiar with the scientific method, if you're just looking to really connect with other people in your class as you begin this journey at Rouser College, uh, that will be offered. And you may not see it on the schedule of classes right now, but we will be advertising it over the summer to all of the first year students. And there's several other freshman seminar classes that you could also uh, pick up more units in um, that are meant to be small, um, small courses. Um, small exploratory courses. Um, okay, another question from the Q&A. Uh, is it recommended that I take summer courses this summer? And if not this summer, have either of you uh, experienced summer session at UC Berkeley? And what is that like? Yeah, good question. Um, I wouldn't say it's like recommended by like any of us at Rouser. Like you can um, choose what you want to do. I will say that summer courses might be a rude awakening as a first experience in college just because you are squishing a semester's worth of material into eight weeks, uh, sometimes six weeks, depending on what course you're taking. 
Uh, one thing to note is that if you do want to take summer courses and you're on financial aid, you must be taking at least six units to qualify for financial aid um, this summer. So that does mean you have to take more than one class. And normally I would say taking one class is already a lot, but if you really have nothing to do and you just wanna get into the Cal experience, uh, summer classes are a great way to do that. Um, so yeah, it's really up to you. And I don't think there's a pro or con to doing it or not doing it. Um, when I experienced summer sessions at Berkeley, I took Chem 3A over the summer. Um, I would say overall, it was a good experience, but taking a technical like that, uh, Chem 3A is the first semester of organic chemistry. It's usually the second chem course you take as a bioscience major. And it was a little bit like we would have a midterm like once every like several weeks, right? And I feel like I would go from knowing no material on the Friday before the midterm to knowing everything by Sunday night which is a lot and it's kind of scary, but um, you can do it. Um, so yeah, that was my experience with summer classes. I actually did uh, summer bridge um, the summer before my first fall semester. So the summer before my freshman year. And um, I had, I really enjoyed it personally. I had a good experience. Um, there are some classes that you can take over the summer that are less intense than they are during the year. That's not always the case because a lot of the times during the summer, it's a condensed um, course where they have to teach a lot of information in a small amount of time. And sometimes you have to sit through like hours of a class. So if that's not what you're interested in, then I wouldn't recommend it if you're not willing to like sit through hours and um, spend a lot of your time just focusing on one or two classes. Um, but there are some classes that are easier over the summer that are actually really enjoyable. For instance, um, there's ESPM 50 AC. And I know that that's a super popular class during the year. So if you take it during the summer, it's usually less in demand and it's taught by the same professor. And um, it's just a really good, it's a really good class to take over the summer. It's, a, it's um, good for breath requirements or your AC requirement. And um, it's just an overall great class that the ESPM department offers. Okay, does moving into another college or major mean I get less time to complete my courses for that college or major that I'm interested in? Um, would, oh, whoopsie, would we be in college longer because I know there are some five uh, some students who are on the five-year plan. Um, uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, so as someone who did change majors twice and colleges once, um, I am graduating in four years. I'm actually graduating this semester. It was kind of weird to think about, but um, it's definitely possible. But again, you have to do that cross-referencing at the beginning, right? Making sure that whatever you're taking will still count for something, even if you switch majors. Now, if you're switching to like a wildly different major, that may not always be the case, but I think as long as you try your best to plan early, that will always land you um, in the best case uh, scenario relative to the worst. Um, so yeah, plan early, talk to your advisors frequently um, if changing majors is something that you think about a lot. Browser College is also a little bit different in that we have a semester maximum as opposed to a unit maximum. You'll see um, other colleges talking about reaching sort of a, a unit limits. Uh, for Rouser, you know, with transfer students, uh, they're uh, allotted uh, four semesters to finish their degree. Um, for students beginning as fresh, it's eight semesters. And then we do have special circumstances that allow for extra semesters. So students on reduced course plan for a variety of reasons, including DSP, um, uh, family responsibility, things like that. If you are a uh, double major or a simultaneous degree student, which is basically a double major between two different colleges, um, you can be granted an extra semester for that. If you study abroad, you can be granted an extra semester for that. So um, there's definitely some flexibility towards the end for certain circumstances, but largely when students are declaring their major, part of the check we do is making sure that you can complete the degree on time and that you have you know, all the sequencing like, like uh, Rachel was talking about in terms 
So making sure that this course is done before I can move on to those extra or those upper division courses, uh, that that sequencing is, is in place. Um, Anna, as we wrap things up here, I'm wondering if you might want to talk a little bit about when they're going to get to meet you and what does, uh, what does uh, Golden Bear Advising look like? Yes, so I just put the contact information in the chat, but as far as when you'll meet me or when we get kind of advisors, so officially once you're admitted to Berkeley and you accept your offer of admission, you, that means that you will be considered a Berkeley student. We are going to be your advisors in that case. But right now, generally, if you message your advisor, we're also advising all the continuing students as they register for their classes for next semester. So you're welcome to send your questions, but just be aware that we might not have appointments available necessarily this week but you're definitely encouraged to talk to the peer advisors about to the majors to, to go to the virtual front desk, which is also on that link in the meantime. And then over the summer as well, you'll go through a whole platform called the um, Golden Bear Advising Modules. Um, so that's GBO or GBA. GBO refers to the orientation itself. GBA is the Golden Bear Advising Modules that you'll go through over the summer. And in those modules, you'll learn all sorts of things about how to register for classes, what a typical schedule looks like, the opportunities at Berkeley. So we really encourage you before, don't worry too much about exactly what your schedule is going to look like for the fall right now. You'll have a whole modules to work on that will help guide you th through that process. And then every advisor will look through your submitted schedule in, that, in those modules and provide specific feedback to you based off of that schedule. So that so there will be some dedicated time to you this summer, especially, and you can make other appointments with your advisor then and see them potentially in drop-ins as well over the summer. Great, thank you. You know, I'm gonna ask one last uh, question for our pals is, if you could tell your freshman self one piece of advice, uh, knowing what you know now, what might that be? I, I'll give Rachel a little bit more time to think since she's, she's been on campus longer than me. Um, but, oh, oh boy, so many things. I would say um, reach out if you need help. Don't be afraid to reach out if you need help. Um, especially in classes, if you're like struggling, there's the SLC, the Student Learning Center. There's also, you know, reach out to your professors, reach out to your GSIs or your TAs, make those connections. And um, so, yeah, just don't, don't, uh, don't be afraid to ask for help, even though, you know, everyone around you is so smart and we're at such a, you know, renowned university. There's no shame in needing help to get where you want to go. Mm. Uh, sorry to clarify, this is just like advice in general for students. Yeah, maybe if, if you had a piece of advice to give your freshman self, what would it be? Okay, um, I would say, okay, maybe, maybe I'll give to you all. Ditto Olivia, definitely don't be afraid to reach out for help. I know that can seem really hard to do on this campus, but I promise you it's worth it. Like again, whether that be to the professor, graduate student instructor, SLC, definitely do that. Um, I would also say, oh, there we go. Find, find community. Um, I, I know like people say that, like that was said to me as well, but as someone who didn't really have that in high school, I didn't really know what that meant. So telling you what that means, that means like join a club, join a sport, I'm part of Cal Figure Skating. That's a really nice community for me. I'm also a part of a few clubs on campus and they can be clubs related to your um, ethnicity. If you wanna connect more with students from the same culture, you can join clubs that are service-based, like I said before, um, or just clubs about you know fun hobbies that you have like songwriting at Berkeley. Um, so just find a space where you can find your people um, it's super important, even if it sounds trivial to you right now, um, those people will be your saving grace when times get hard, um, and you can be that person there for them as well when times get hard. 
I definitely second that. <laughs> but yeah. Um, find a, find a place that you can like call home and find people that you enjoy spending time with for sure. That's wonderful advice. Um, and just to show you, to show you how maybe obscure some of those interests are, but are very, very popular. One of my favorite things to see uh, when I'm walking um, uh, outside of the College of Natural Resources, when, when we were meeting in person, obviously, is out on the lawn right outside of Mulford Hall. Oh, actually, it's, oh, does anyone have it in, oh, no one has it in their background. Um, but there's a big lawn that runs across, uh, right along Strawberry Creek. And during the fall semester, the intramural Quidditch games take place there, practices take there, place there. And you see all of these 20 something students with brooms between their legs, throwing balls at each other. And it's just, and everyone's having a really fun time. Um, so it could even be as, as niche as that, you'll be able to find your community. Um, um, we are at time. So we're going to wrap up here. I want to thank everyone for attending. Um, we hope that you will reach out to us with your questions. And, and as you are exploring the majors at Rouser College, we have info sessions too every evening this week, except for Friday, where we have our last one. Um, so you can learn literally about every single major in Rouser College over the course of the evenings uh, this week. Uh, we have our student experience panels taking place um, on Tuesday and Thursday. So Thursday is going to be the general one for students entering as fresh. Uh, Tuesday is specifically for transfer students. So if you're undeclared, you're probably not a transfer student. Um, and um, yeah, I hope that you will reach out to us. I want to thank our panelists, Rachel and Olivia. Thank you so much for your time and for giving us your experiences today. Thank you to Anna and Craig for monitoring the Q&A and keeping me organized there. And um, yeah, go Bears. Go Bears. <laughs> Bears. Thanks everyone for coming.